by these general assemblies, there are horizontal structures led by facilitation teams that anybody could be a part of. Sometimes those, those general assemblies um, reach to thousands of people, and they still broke down and did small group discussions of issues that they thought were important for people to talk about. It was really, I think, a beautiful exercise in, dem in direct democracy and what uh, a movement without leaders could look like. Um, one of the, and I think you could go to the next slide. So that's a slide of Oscar Grant Plaza and a general, where the general assemblies were held and a general assembly is taking place here. Um, it's kind of an open plaza area. One general assembly that I remember going to was after the, after the first uh, eviction of the plaza on October 25th. And um, at that general assembly, a proposal was being brought forth to do a general strike the following week. Now, as a kind of Marxist person with some community organizing background, I thought that they were like freaking crazy. They're going to do a general strike in the course of a week. You know, yeah, they have 2,000 people at this meeting, but they don't really have relationships in place that you could build that. Um, and so I abstained from the yes vote on that. Um, but I appreciated the process that they were going through. And I was really excited to be out on the streets on November 2nd on the day of the, the general strike. And I got up really early, which those of you who know me know I don't really do. Um, and I was out there at 8 a.m. I participated in every march that day. There were various marches throughout the day, culminating in the last huge march um, from Oscar Grant Plaza all the way to the Port of Oakland, where we, where we, and by we, I'm talking about a group of what estimates range from 20,000 to 50,000 people, closed down the Port of Oakland. That's historic. And this was the scene. And so there's so many romantic images of Occupy Oakland. They get a little bit wrapped up in their own romanticism. <laughs> but I got to give it to them on this night. Um, the, the sun is setting. It's a, you know, orange sky. Young people are climbing upon every big rig that they can, hoisting flags of all colors, um, and claiming the space and shutting down the and so, um, so I think that there's something to me physically as well, kind of watching myself in that space, that feeling of what it feels like to be in a liberated zone, right? And how one feels that in one's body. And how different that feels from other places that I am. And so I just kind of um, put that out there I think I'll go kind of like explaining some of the problematics of, of the Occupy Yeah, so definitely I think what the organizing principle of um, the group of people who are behind a lot of um, how Occupy Oakland organizes is a certain tendency of anarchists. They call themselves insurrectionist anarchists. Um, and they have a pretty militant um, idea of what constitutes an autonomous zone, and they constructed Oscar Grant Plaza as an autonomous zone. Um, <coughs> no camps were no cops were allowed in the camp at all, ever. They were physically blockaded from entry, um, and they were able to hold. They had enough people to actually be able to do that. Um, they set up tents in a camp. They created their own infrastructure, a kitchen, a library, a medical tent, uh, teams of their own security to keep people safe and to try to defuse conflict in the camp. So um, I think that they're drawing in part off of a Zapatista way of organizing and creating an <coughs> autonomous zone. I think that it's kind of, you know, there's problematics of trying to do that inside of the middle of a city. But nevertheless, that, that did occur in the time that they were able to hold that space. The political formation of Occupy Oakland, um, the way decisions were made is by what they called a modified consensus. In order to pass a proposal, anybody could bring a proposal, but in order to pass it, you had to have 90% yes vote. 
that was a pretty high bar and pretty hard to reach. Um, there would be absolutely no special treatment of elected officials. When the mayor came to speak, um, she was told she had to get in the same queue um, as everybody else did if she wanted to speak to us, and she decided she didn't really want to get in the queue. Um, autonomous activities are okay within the framework of Occupy Oakland, so if you have a proposal and it doesn't get 90%, but you want to do it anyways, you can basically form an affinity group and go out and do it so people are kind of empowered in that way. Um, there were working committees set up in media, facilitation, finance, anti-repression, and children's village um, were some of the more popular committees. So key events in Occupy Oakland were the first eviction on, November, on October 25th, the general strike on November 2nd, uh, the second and final eviction on November 14th, uh, the decolonized name change vote, which I'm going to explain in a minute, and the West Coast port shutdown on December 12th. And that was the last really big action that occupies it. So this is a watercolor by Karina Lomali, who's an artist affiliated with the movement. In, it's a scene of the port, and the, in her mind's eye, this didn't happen in reality, um, one of the banners that was flung over um, says decolonize Oakland. So, and then the, to the next slide. And then this is a poster made by the artist Melanie Cervantes of Dignidad Rebelde, and she did this really beautiful Occupy, uh, Oakland is occupied, Ohlone land, Decolonize the 99% depend Mother Earth. So one of the problematics right away within Occupy Oakland was the relationship between the people of color in Occupy Oakland um, and the rest of, of the camp. And so fairly quickly, a POC caucus was formed, and that caucus was, again, fairly quickly renamed the QPOC POC caucus. So Queer issues were front and center from the beginning in the formation of an autonomous space inside of Occupy Oakland for people of color. Um, but the name was a real sticking type point for a lot of people for obvious reasons. The idea of being part of something that was occupying when what we understand that Oakland is already occupied and we don't really need another group of people to come in and occupy. So that was our general kind of you know, one, one tendency of discussion that was going on and was kind of ongoing throughout the camp. Um, at a certain point in time, Morningstar, who's actually in this picture, you can't really see her, who's an Ohlone woman, came up with the idea that she wanted to bring the proposal to the General Assembly to change the name Occupy Oakland to Decolonize Oakland. And so she brought that proposal and um, it came before a General Assembly. That General Assembly was packed. Catriona was there. It was the most people of color that had been at any General Assembly that I had seen. Because uh, top, bottom up <coughs> organizing is really lengthy and takes a lot of time, that General Assembly lasted for about six hours. As people got up, streamed up to speak their truth, of why we should change the name to Decolonize Oakland. So we reached, when the vote happened, 68% voted to change the name. And so the, the proposal did not pass. And we actually needed 70% to get up to this other tier where we would be allowed to enter into compromise talks. So it was a defeat, and it was a rather resounding defeat. After that time, the QPOC caucus, um, decided to uh, break away from Occupy. And so we declared ourselves, the QPOC caucus declared ourselves an autonomous group, and we renamed ourselves Decolonize Oakland. And that's the crew I've been rolling with since uh, January when that happened. So to, decl to declare ourselves autonomous, we issued a communique which reads in part, Decolonize Oakland, formerly the QPOC POC Caucus of Occupy Oakland, would like to reintroduce ourselves to you, our communities, as an autonomous collective. We believe that working autonomously 
will give us the freedom to build power from below. Occupy Oakland's failure to fully address the ways that race, gender, and sexual oppression intersect with capitalism in the lives of Oak Oakland's communities of color has made it challenging for us to work under the Occupy umbrella. <clears throat> Moreover, the unchecked race and gender privilege within Occupy Oakland's organizing structures have made it difficult for many of our members to fully participate in Occupy meetings and events. We drafted points of unity, which included the following. The following. They're longer and they're available on our website. But we say we decolonize because any movement that doesn't, take in, that doesn't confront the continuing force of colonization, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and white supremacy replicates these oppressions. We decolonize to claim spaces of self-determination for communities of color in Oakland. We welcome the collaboration with any group, including Occupy, on any and all projects that, can see, that coincide with our core values. That is the radical, to the root, project of decolonization, liberation, and self-determination of communities of color, with a particular and non-negotiable commitment to women of color and queers of color within those communities. From those points of unity, our group has organized an encuentro, which we held at Corazón del Pueblo in the Fruitvale. We called for and organized a mass immigrant rights march on May Day, and I'm going to show you pictures from that in a minute. And we're currently, in fact, right this minute, holding a community picket line in front of Mi Pueblo supermarket in defense of workers there who are being subjected to an I-9 audit and really repressive working conditions from the owner of Mi Pueblo. So all of you in the Bay Area, we're launching a boycott of Mi Pueblo, so please don't shop there. Um, so let me show you and talk to you a little bit about our May Day action. So this is our crew. Uh, this is a part of our crew decolonization. Um, and So this was a, a photo of the May Day action. Uh, the thinking behind Decolonize Oakland was, we knew that Occupy Oakland was gonna call for a general strike on May Day. We also knew that their power was m much diminished from the time when they called their first general strike, uh, when they really were able to mobilize 30,000 people on the, on the streets. Uh, we, so we formed a community coalition with immigrant rights groups um, and we put together a Dignity and Resistance Coalition to plan a, a march. There was a lot of controversy. We approached Occupy Oakland many, many times um, to find ways that we could work together. Uh, Occupy Oakland was really upset because the Dignity and Resistance Coalition decided that we would get a permit to march in the street and Occupy Oakland always marches without permits. Um, that's a militant stand that they have, which I respect. I think that's a principled position, and I respect it. But we got really um, browbeated by agreeing to have a, a permit for our march. Um, so they, they blocked up. They, they just they did black block tactics on May Day. Um, and we marched from Fruitville to San Antonio Park, and without any kind of... Um, way of coordinating before, they kind of on the fly, which is how they operate, they decided to march from OGP to uh, San Antonio Park, where we collided. Um, so let me show some more pictures. Um, these are the um, Pacific Steel workers who were leading the Dignity and Resistance March. Uh, part of how we did it, I wish, can you get to hit this lights? Uh, the lights? Yeah, the lights. The back lights. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's it's by the door? Yeah, yeah. Just this? Say off? Yeah. Yeah, you can see that. yeah that's better. So, uh, the, the one way that we wanted to get our word out was by making um, visuals. So, we have decolonize and we had a bunch of slogans. This one is mas policia, menos policia. Yeah. Uh, this one is, is if you're dissing the sisters, you, you're, you, ain't, you ain't fighting the power. Pinches <laughs> fronteras. <laughs> 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 
And this one, a small, a small chicanito holding up a um, col decolonized uh, with Flores Magón on it. Um, so this was uh, our way of taking the message of decolonization out into the streets and out into the community. Uh, I think there's a, yeah, so decolonize, and then there's one more of our, we actually built a, go ahead. Back. Somehow the float got messed up. So we actually built a Santa Maria float after the mutiny um, with the, an erected, um, yeah, <laughs> It's just, it's just not there. Okay. <laughs> so, so in reflect, recently in reflecting about our, the work of decolonize, one thing that we feel we have done um, is gotten that concept of decolonization out into the local community and certainly into activist communities in the Bay. When we proposed the name change, one of the main arguments against the name change came from Boots Riley, who's a local kind of hip hop phenomena. And he opposed the name change because he said people in the hood didn't understand the word decolonize. Mm -hmm. And so we took that as a challenge, that, that that's work that we needed to do, to figure out how we can make that word decolonize something that resonates among local communities. And so in the work of this um, march, that's one, one way in which we've done that. And we have some other projects underway that are going to do that even more, uh, using art and putting it up in communities. So, let's see. Now. I'm trying to figure out how to go. So what I think is that there's a lot to learn, even though there's a lot to criticize in how Occupy Oakland was formed and the politics that they do, I think that there's a lot to be learned from their militant stance. Um, one thing that they are really strong upon, and they, they critique us always of, of plain identity politics, which I don't think we do, but what I understand from their critique of identity politics is that they are fundamentally opposed to one group, one person speaking for an entire group. And that's actually a, a challenge that I take to heart. I think that silence is somebody speaking for you, right? And that we all have to, um, we, we all speak for ourselves, and we cannot speak for the, the multiplicity of people who form even our tight groups, right? I could never um, claim to speak for all the Holteria, right? My experience is, is really mine alone, and it comes from a really particular location. They can't really be extended. So I think we have to claim that space um, of contingent knowledge and of allowing people to speak their truth and for us to hear that truth. Um, I take their corrective of to identity politics. I take their corrective to representational politics. It's clearly our politicians are not representing us. They haven't for a long time, if ever. Um, Obama does not speak for me, nor does Jerry Brown, who just vetoed some really important uh, legislation in California, right? Um, I'm also strongly in alignment with Occupy Oakland's militant stance against politicians in general. I don't think that we should negotiate with them. I don't think we even need to t um, talk to them. Um, I appreciate a direct action approach to politics where we, where we use our force and our power as we um, mobilize it to demand changes. Um, we can take creative actions and occupy has against banks, against police brutality, against foreclosures. We can stand in front of homes that are about to be foreclosed and we can stop the foreclosures. Um, and I actually have come to appreciate Occupy Oakland's um, quite controversial call for diversity of tactics. Diversity of tactics is their refusal to embrace nonviolent methods only, right? Um, and I'm not against attacking corporate, pol um, corporate headquarters, banks, whatever, if there's a clear reason for doing so and if it somehow forwards our agenda. Um, and I'm not totally against black bloc tactics. Dressing up in black bloc is a way to... Um, protect a crowd and keep people safe, although the way that it's done a lot of times is beyond ridiculous and really like hot doggy. Um, 
I also love that Occupy enacts a kind of mili militant politics meets DIY aesthetic in everything they do. They do everything from scratch and they figure out how to get it done with what they have um, with very really little resources and no money. Um, they feed people, they, they care for sick people, um, they used bikes to generate electricity in the camp, and they planted gardens friggin' everywhere. That was dope. Um, but ultimately, the, the underlying white supremacy that was um, just rampant inside of Occupy Oakland really s destroyed the possibility of it seizing the moral authority um, within the context of Oakland. Oakland is, after all, 75% people of color town. Um, and these numbers were never reflected in Occupy Oakland, um, not at the camp and much less in the small cadre that's really calling the shots. Those who hold most of the power in Occupy are a small group of white men. They tend to react to any critique of racial dynamics as um, in a really like knee-jerk way, critiquing them as like you're just playing identity politics, um, you're liberal, and you must be from a nonprofit. Those are their most three um, um, biggest kind of comebacks to us. They also like to label us divisive. Um, and so what that brings home for me is like the ongoing need for women of color feminism because it feels like I've learned that lesson so long ago. Um, and it, but, but also lessons need to be learned over and over and over. I do agree with Occupy Oakland, the militants in Occupy Oakland, that we cannot rely on strategies and tactics that we've used in the past. We need to become more militant. Um, there's been a steady erosion of gains since the last militant movements, which were in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the redistribution of, of wealth is just of epic proportions, and it's being made possible by ever-increasing state repression, both in the terms of both in terms of the prison industrial complex, but also in terms of local police force, forces um, really infiltrating movements and trying to destroy them from within. This current moment, I believe this moment in history presents us with an opening, and I want us to take full advantage of it. I see this opening in three places. One, in resistance to austerity measures, which are happening everywhere across the globe, but most notably perhaps recently in Quebec, where the students successfully fought back tuition increases. And they did that by being in the streets day after day, week after week, month after month, until they made the government back down. What, you know, and we're not there yet here. <coughs> What's it going to take for us to get there? I also see the opening in the undocumented and unafraid movement. We have been absolutely at a standstill on, on, on immigration reform until these young, brave people took the risk to put their bodies on the line in direct action in senators' offices. That's the kind of action that I'm talking about. And lastly, I see this opening in the decolonize and occupy movements, which I'll put together for these purposes. I see them being directly related to the kind of movements happening in Spain with the indignados. And I think that these kind of movements need to be supported, expanded, deepened, engaged, criticized, and pushed forward. In these sites of social struggle, we have at, at long last seen some new militant strategies emerge. Obviously, internal problems and dynamics will always exist. The question should not be that we leave because of those dynamics, but we ask ourselves and we challenge ourselves to productively engage these dynamics. How do we insert ourselves as queer militant Latinos inside of these struggles so that our voices are heard and represented? And how do we be honest and disentangle ourselves from the parts of the, uh, from certain parts of the academic industrial complex and the nonprofit industrial complexes that hold us back and make us complicit in the largest, the larger capitalist structures that imprison our communities? I call on all of us to leave our comfort zones and re-engage questions of revolutionary social change. There is much uncertainty at head. One thing, though, is clear. Global capitalism is in a state of crisis, and I believe it will be in a perpetual state of crisis going forward. 
um, this is not the first, this is not a blip in the, in, and then everything's going to get better. Governments everywhere are cramming austerity measures down the throats of their people. These have direct effects on our lives, on our, on education, on funding for our programs, and on the arts. Of course, we must react by, um, on these cuts by building a huge social movement. I'm inspired as well. I see inspiration everywhere. The Somos 132 movement in Mexico, the Ignados in Spain, undocumented and unafraid movement. I think we need to forget about the electoral system. There's nothing there for us. Um, except for in really local issues where we can mobilize and make a difference. Instead, we need to be in the streets. We need to be at blocking entrances. We need to be um, re-envisioning a future. The progress, yeah, I already said that. <laughs> Power, I mean, ultimately it comes down to that old quote, power exceeds nothing without demand. So it's time for us to start making demands. And I want to see P QPOC, queer people of color, front and center in these militant struggles. I want us to create autonomous zones in various cities. Autonomous zones is places where we can experiment creating the kinds of societies that we want. Um, where we do mutual aid in real ways, where we swap, do sw food swaps, <coughs> skill shares, community gardens, community feeds, general assemblies, where we learn to govern ourselves, where we learn to solve our own conflicts. Um, I want these spaces to be decolonized spaces. Um, and we can work in other ways as well, because that work has to be really local. But we can work together over the internet, issuing um, manifestos, condemning repressions, calling for solidarity, giving um, solidarity. In these spaces, we, could, we need to create structures of accountability and restorative justice so that we can work through our own problems <coughs> um, without involving external powers. I'm aware of a group in, in LA, Revolutionary Autonomous Communities. I don't know if some of you know them. But they're doing exactly the kind of work that I'm calling for. Um, and I think we need to, to embrace the slo that slogan, that Zapatista slogan, un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos, a call for pluriversality, right? There's not one way to organize, not a one-size-fits-all approach, because a, decol a decolonial future must allow for multiple spiritualities, multiple epistemologies, multiple temporalities. We are headed neither for a mythic past nor towards some already envisioned utopic future. The future is ours, but it will emerge out of struggle, as it should. For this work to happen, we need to work on expanding our skill sets in the years ahead. And we need everyone, academics, artists, activists, gardeners, brujos, builders. I call on all of us to get out there and engage on a, on, on the, in on-the-ground conversations about militant social change. We can no longer afford to speak just to each other. Um, we need to grow our networks. We need to globalize our struggle, and at the same time, we need to localize so that we all have networks in place that we can pull together to provide basic human needs in the event of economic <coughs> meltdown. I consider my politics as like Octavia Butler meets Karl Marx meets the anarchist, right? Because like Lauren Olamina, she's the one that I'm thinking of, you know? I want to have my backpack. And if you guys haven't read Peril the Sower, you guys got to read it, you know? Um, we got to be ready for that meltdown, you know? Because it's going to be us who are going to be saving each other. Um, we need to learn how to grow food to survive. We need to set, learn how to set up our own schools, our own clinics. I'm so inspired by these two African-American women in deep East Oakland who call themselves the community medics and go around teaching people how to treat gunshot wounds because of the fact that ambulances don't get there in time. But that's what we need. That is the model going forward. We need to imagine autonomous communities based on equal participation and mutual aid. Probably all of us will learn how to, will, will undoubtedly learn, need to learn, how to deal with our own relative privilege in relation to others in our community so that we can interact with them and build horizontally. Um, we need to enter the spaces bringing everything that we have to offer but we also need to enter those spaces with an absolute humility, acknowledging that our knowledge is partial and contingent, 
and that we have much to learn. For too long, I feel like we've been putting our collective energy into simply surviving in this fucked up system that we live in. I think now is the time to step back and, stop, and start working in earnest to dismantle the system. Thank you.